Hello, everybody. Uh, so I'm Ash Henson from SOAS. I'm doing a postdoc. Today, I'm going to talk about using network theory, which uh, James called graph theory, but same thing, different name, to detect Ryan communities in Han Dynasty Chinese. OK, so <clears throat> basically, just to give an, an introduction and background, uh, I'm gonna, today I'll be talking, well, the, the structure of the talk, I'll be talking about, I'll introduce the problem, uh, go a little bit over previous studies, and then talk a little bit about Bailey's method, which is from Julian sitting over here, uh, and then applying his method to the Han Dynasty corpus and talk a little bit about the results. And I just like to show, I, I personally fell in love with Chinese characters and it, took me from, an, I have two degrees in engineering and I switched to doing linguistics because of this. So I always like to show some of the beauty of the characters because it's for me very motivating. Uh, th this actually is, I drew that myself. It was for a, a paper I had to do on the on Lao Tzu. Okay, so <clears throat> problem introduction. Basically there's been a lot of work done on middle Chinese and a lot of work done on old Chinese and Han Dynasty Chinese falls in between these, but it's not, it's not just that it, time-wise falls in between. It's actually a crux uh, of change between Old Chinese and Middle Chinese. And so why the Han Dynasty? Well, we see here Old Chinese, which I just said there's been a lot of work done on it, and we see Middle Chinese, and then there's this big blank spot in the middle. Uh, well, actually, also depending on your definition of Old Chinese, some scholars actually include the Han Dynasty as part of Old Chinese. Uh, we go by the like basically Baxter definition, so it doesn't include Han Chinese. So the Han falls here right in the middle of these other two. And it's interesting to note too that though there's still also a blank spot here, the amount of sound change that happens here is larger than what happens in this later period. Okay, so this is uh, Baxter in his 1992 book, uh, list out a bunch of sound changes that happen between Old Chinese and Middle Chinese. And this is just a small list. And th these are the actual sound changes that are thought to have happened during the Han Dynasty. There's another, I believe, 18 changes which may or may not have happened during the Han Dynasty. And so these are some of the questions that we would like to answer with this project. And the previous studies uh, in modern times, actually Bodman, well, there's a, there was a Qing Dynasty scholar that did some stuff on Han Dynasty. Uh, and then, but in modern times, we have Bodman's uh, Shiming study and the Luo from Luo and Zhou. Uh, Luo actually suggested to Bodman to do that study, probably because he anticipated they were going to uh, study the finals while he had Bodman study the initials. So the, these were. <laughs> These studies are actually still quoted in, in when people do Han Dynasty stuff today. Uh, after this, you have Coblin did the sound gloss study back in 1983, and then Schusler's late Han, late Han Chinese reconstructions from 2009. Um, kind of a common issue that all these studies have is that they don't take the Han data set in its own right. They kind of interpret it in terms of somebody's old Chinese reconstruction, like basically they say, well, you have old Chinese and you have middle Chinese and this Han fits here in the middle. Well, the problem with doing it that way is you're bringing in all the old Chinese reconstructions have tons of assumptions. And when you do that, you're bringing these assumptions along with you into, into Han. And you're not looking at the data at, in its own right so that you're not able to disprove things about old Chinese that might not be true or about, about middle Chinese. And then there's also the question of, is Han Dynasty Chinese a direct uh, descendant of old Chinese? And that may or may not be the case because there's multiple dialects going on. Uh, and then they also tend to treat Han as slightly modified middle Chinese. Um, and that's also a huge assumption uh, given the time distance that I showed earlier. So as James mentioned, uh, graph theory, I'm calling it network theory. Uh, our study is based on using network theory. And network theory is essentially, 
if you ever, if you guys use Facebook and they say, hey, do you know this person? Uh, that's a case of you're interacting with network theory. <laughs> so Facebook has an algorithm which treats people as nodes and then the relationships between people are edges. So a, a, a network is just a, a way of representing relationships between objects, or in this case, or Facebook cases, people. In our case, we're talking about rhyme words in Han Dynasty text. Uh, this graph here is showing flights out of Atlanta, Georgia. And so the nodes that are bigger, it just means there's more flights going on between those. So the smaller nodes, like there's not very many flights, there are not as many flights going to these type of nodes. And the, the big, obviously you're, you're going to appear in the big cities, right? So this is just using network theory and applying it to, to flights. Okay, so uh, Julian wrote a paper a few years back about applying network theory to uh, Tang Dynasty and Song Dynasty poems. And he used this to create an annotator, which would go in and automatically annotate. So, so, so this is a big problem, right? We, we've got just thousands upon thousands. In fact, his, his study had 250,000 poems, a lot of which have not been annotated. And you can imagine if you want to go in and annotate 250,000 poems, you're talking about many years of time, even if you have a large group of people doing it, and then they, you might be making all kinds of mistakes. Right? There's just all kinds of problems that can happen. So he came up with a way of automatically annotating these poems. And by, the way he did that was he would assume a rhyming structure, which is basically the last character of every other line rhymes. And then he would use this to, this, this is, uh, well, the, the naive annotator would assume that any character in rhyming position in the same stanza of the same poem rhymes. Uh, obviously that's a very naive assumption. Poems don't always turn out that way. But then he also has other annotators, uh, which he and he would test the annotators against each other. So you had the middle Chinese annotator, which is based on the Guangyun. So that would say, you know, because we know what words rhymed in the Guangyun, right? And so you apply this to Tang and, and Song poetry. And then using the, the network theory stuff, you also have community detection algorithms, which also James talked about. So these community detection algorithms, basically they just look at the nodes and which nodes connect to which other nodes and then how many, how often they connect and these kind of things. And then they come up with communities and the, the, the algorithm says, okay, I think these guys rhyme and I think these guys rhyme. And so he had, as far as data, like I just said, he had 250,000 poems, which is millions of lines of poetry. Now we're not as in a, as good of a position for doing Han Dynasty because the amount of data is just much smaller. So for our project, we also have a naive annotator. We also have a community annotator. Uh, a point where we differ is that we use Schusler's uh, 2009 late Han reconstructions as our, uh, what, he, what he used the Guangyun because there was no rhyme book from the Han Dynasty that we can use. So we had to use something else. And then here's the amount of data, which is obviously way less. We have for received poetry, uh, 5.4 thousand lines. Uh, though I will say, this doesn't represent the end. There's still other poetry we can bring in. We just haven't got around to it yet. Uh, we have mirrors, which have 44,000 lines, but the problem with the mirror, I say problem, is it's good data, but the problem is it's very formulaic. So there, there'll be like two characters that just rhyme hundreds of times, right? And so what, what that essentially means is we don't have 44,000 lines of unique data. So it's, it's actually much smaller than what it looks like. And then we have 873 lines of stele data. And we also have bronze data and um, bamboo data, which will be added in later. We just haven't added it in yet. So I'm gonna kind of talk about, you know, the naive, the different types of annotators, but show kind of real data at the same time so we can save time for, for the presentation. This is a character, uh, the character. This is a poem, uh, it's called The Unnamed Song by Sima Xiangru. And so the, the, like I said before, the naive annotator just says any character that's in rhyming position rhymes. So in this case, it's Bei and Shui. And A, I guess I use the pointer, A, it's just a marker. It's just saying that 
any two characters that are marked A that are in the same stanza rhyme is essentially what that means, but there's no meaning to using A, it could be any symbol. And in fact, you will see here we are with the Schusler annotator. So in addition to having a rhyme marker like A and B, we also have the his reconstructions in there. So you see that they end in I, but that the main vowels are different. So the Schusler annotator is much more strict than the, the naive, the naive annotator is not strict at all. Anything in rhyme position rhymes, Schusler, no, it has to be exactly the same or the rhyme. So we see here, Schuster says, no, these characters do not rhyme. And then we move on to the community annotator and the community annotator to repeat once again, is based upon the nodes and edges and these algorithms going in and figuring out which groups rhyme. And according to the algorithms, these characters do rhyme. Now to move on to a, a bit more interesting data because two rhyming characters isn't all that interesting. Uh, we'll look at this um, Chinga Arsho. So once again, we have the, the naive annotator. And once again, nothing new, nothing unexpected. It's all A, they all rhyme. But I'll, I'll just show that these are actually two different groups. So this is one stanza and this space represents a split between stanzas and we have another stanza. So even though they're all marked A, these A's actually aren't guaranteed to rhyme with these A's. And then we look at Schusler, and I'm, I'm kind of losing the bottom of the slide. There's a, uh, another one down here. And I can't remember if it rhymes or not. I'm thinking it doesn't, but I don't know how to make the bottom. Let me uh, see if I can. I don't know. Just don't worry about it. It's mine. We're going to say it doesn't. I think it doesn't rhyme. I think, I think it ends also in an I, but there's a different main vowel. But then we move back and we look at the community annotator and the community, community annotator agrees with the naive annotator that these all rhyme and these all rhyme. So when I was, I mentioned this earlier that Julian in his paper also took these different cases where you look at all three agree and then two agree and one disagrees and then the, the odd man out is different for different cases. So we'll look at some of these cases. Uh, but before that, I'll talk about the kind of data we're using. Uh, as I've already mentioned, we, we, we're looking at received poetry, stele, and mirror data. And our received poetry comes from this book by uh, Lu Qin Li, where he, he actually collects from, from Qin Han, Wei Jin in Northern Southern dynasties, but we're only using the Han data from that. And then the stele also from the Han and the Wei. And we're also just using the Han part of that. And then same for the mirrors. Uh, the mirrors is this huge collection that this uh, Japanese guy, uh, Hayashi Hiromi, collected over many, many, many years. And it's kind of an interesting story. I won't go into it, but he, he basically was donating a bunch of stuff to a museum and they discovered all this data that he had. And they're like, oh my God, we need to publish this. So they end up publishing all this guy's data, which he didn't publish himself for some <laughs> reason. Now, this is, what do we used to call the, this graph? The spaceship? Yeah. So th th this is kind of, uh, I like this graph because it shows kind of how this works. So like in here, the, a node is actually a kind of a, a group of characters rather than just single characters. And you can kind of see that, the, they're not like these three without even knowing what the reconstructions are. They're all open syllables, even in, in old Chinese. So there's a good chance they could rhyme. But then this one definitely isn't going to rhyme with these because they're, I mean, uh, but then if you look at these two, like, ooh, 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 they, they all rhyme in Mandarin, which obviously doesn't mean they rhyme in the earlier versions of Chinese. But, at any rate, it's kind of a it's kind of a, a sanity check. I like to say this is something in engineering we we do all the time to make sure we're not going off the deep end. So this was my sanity check where I would check cluster one and in the seventy four these characters are all basically the same rhyme group, and then these five are the same, and these twenty are the same. So you can see that we haven't converged on it yet, but but this is very likely due to the amount of data we put through. 
Um, so, but but at least the algorithms are getting 80% correct. And then 92 in this group, 91 in this group down here. So we, we see there is some convergence going on. It hasn't completed, but as we add more data to it, then it, they should converge to a higher degree than we have already. Yeah, wrong way. So now I'm gonna show some of the graph aspects. And <laughs> this looks like a mess at first glance. Uh, but even in this mess, the very interesting thing is if you look around the edges, you can start seeing like little groups that form around these edges. Here. And then, so this is the same data set, but the difference is, so the first data set is the naive annotator. So this is the one that assumes all characters in the same, the, in the rhyming position rhyme. And this is run over the combined data, so all three data sets. And so what we did was we ran that, and then we ran these algorithms and figure out what communities the algorithms thought there were, and then put uh, show the same graph, but the color groups are the are the graphs that are supposed to be rhyming. And if you can, I don't know if you can see my the characters are kind of small probably from where you're sitting, but. You can see there's clusters forming these the, the colors being the the clusters, and then here the same graph I've just circled some of the clusters where the where the where the graphs are thought to be rhyming by the community detection algorithms, and then here's the the Schussler data for the same set. Now the Schussler data is obviously much more ordered, but this is completely to be expected given the fact that it will only let something it thinks is 100% the same rhyme. And then there's a bunch of singletons around which James does not like, we found out in the previous presentation. But these singletons come from cases where, say that character appears in a rhyme, like we actually saw one where there was two characters that both ended in I but had different main vowels. And the, the community detectors thought it rhymed. So that would they would appear in the same group, but in the Schusser diagram, they would appear in different groups. And if they don't appear in other rhymes, they're just kind of stuck there by themselves. So these, these singletons are due to how strict the Schussler annotator is. And here's a close up of some of the Schussler groups. And I've, I've got his Greek construction printed out. So you can, you can see that all those characters indeed did rhyme. One thing that was very interesting is up here at the top, you have Jun. And I, I saw that and I thought, oh, that doesn't fit. And I thought, oh, wait a minute. Because paleo, paleographically, it's very, it's, it gets mixed up with Ding all the time. So I went and looked it up in the Guangyun. And indeed, in the Guangyun, it only has an NG ending. It doesn't have an N ending. So Mandarin led me astray there to, to think that it wasn't part of that group when actually it was. Now uh, I'm getting into the case studies and this is model on Julian's paper. So I'm once again, looking at cases where there's some combination of agreement and disagreement between the three annotators where N is for naive, S Schusler, C for community. So this is a, a poem which I've translated as ancient Wu Zazu poem. And Wu Zazu is just a type of poetry and it wouldn't make sense to translate it into English, so I didn't. But at any rate, this is a case where all of the annotators agree. Um, I don't have the naive annotator listed because we all know it's just going to be a big column of A's. So Schusler agrees, and here's Schusler's reconstruction. And then the community annotator also agrees. And one point that's kind of interesting, and it's kind of something that we're hoping the project will answer is that, did tones matter in Han Dynasty poetry? And the first time tones are actually mentioned in Chinese literature is after the Han Dynasty. Actually, I think in the 400s, 500s time frame is the first time we, we know of that Chinese tones are mentioned. And the reason people think the tones were not mentioned until that time period is because the tones hadn't actually completely become tones at that point. So the, the fact that these are all share the same tone is kind of interesting. Although, although 
Schuessler himself would say, maybe that's not a tone, maybe that's just has the ending that would later become a tone. Now here's a case where the naive and the community annotators agree, but they disagree with Schuessler. And it has this interesting rhyme structure of, well, if you're looking at Schuessler, A, A, B, C, A, B, A. Oh, I was, I was just seeing that they were both with this A, but then I was like, why are they different? And it's, it's because the U that it's not a medial U, it's a UA um, diphthong. So the Schuessler annotator would say it's different. And if you look at the old Chinese and middle Chinese for these, you also see that there you have this basically A, 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 B, B, A, B, A structure to it. And it's, it's kind of interesting to think like, why, what does this mean? Basically, does this mean that the Schuessler annotator is correct? Does it mean that Schuessler annotator is too close to old Chinese? Um, and I, I actually don't know the answer. Uh, I just, it's something I would like to look into and understand better. But even in, in middle Chinese, you, you see that it's actually A, A, B, B, A, C, A. So there's a kind of a weirdness with this one character, which also looks a little bit, well, no, it's actually fine for old Chinese, but um, I, I'm just looking at the A's. The Schuessler divides up his A's, and this actually comes up in these differences here. In fact, oh, yeah, here we go. So this is a case where Schuessler agrees with the community annotator, um, but they both disagree. Well, obviously, because there's a bunch of different rhymes here. And like I said, these letters don't mean anything. So the A here for Schuessler does not equal the A here. It's just, they just divide up the stuff differently. They divide up the groups differently. But this, in this case, the, the odd man out seems to be this O here with Y. But if, like Schuessler says that this A and this A, or this A are different, right? But we don't know when the split happens. So the split could have happened before the Han or after the Han or sometime in the Han. And if, if that split had not happened, this thing looks way more like a naive annotator than it would, than it would look otherwise, right? So, this is another thing, is, is Schuessler's splitting of these A's, is he correct in saying that late Han had this, right? And you know, we don't know the answer to that, but this is this data can will probably end up showing us that. And then this is a case where none of them agree. <laughs> so it's it's just a big mess. But even if you look at it, the, the odd one is once again here in the middle with I N, because having an N ending wouldn't rhyme with anything. So once again, why why is it like that? It, it could be that this character had a, uh, a another reading that didn't end in N because N come like there's a theory that in old Chinese you had an R ending and R went to N and also to J, so it could be an open syllable or it could be uh, this closed syllable, and it, it could be the case that this character had an open syllable reading that we and, and it would end in I right because J would go to I, so that's seems actually likely that that's what's going on. Or it could also be that a Han Dynasty poet saw an old Chinese poet rhyme these words and they decided it was okay, even if it didn't make sense in his own dialect. Uh, so we started out just using his, but I mean, the obvious question that you're not saying here is that is Han Dynasty rhyming structure the same yeah. as later, which is probably isn't exactly the same, I would think. Yes. But it, yeah, at this point, uh, for the received poetry, we are using the same annotator. Uh, for the mirrors and the sile, uh, we rhyme every every single line rhymes. Okay. And this comes from the fact that we initially started doing every other line. But if you look at the data, I mean, it's pretty obvious most of it's every line is rhyming. Changing the annotator is something that would come later, if at all. Like um, if we if you because you can imagine. Even though I was saying it's a small amount of data, there was still like 
thousands and thousands of poems, right? So to go in and actually annotate these by hand would just be a, a huge project. So it's not really feasible for the current project. Okay, like if I look at this, to me, I would say it's clear the poet wanted this to rhyme. Yeah. yeah like, I agree. so there's, there's this big question of what are we annotating for? Are we saying, are we annotating for in a reconstruction of the chronology of the language? These are not the same babble, or are we annotating for poets' intention? To me, it brings into question the, the differentiating these two A's, at least for this particular poem. I mean, I don't know if in general that's true, but I agree. Clearly, this was meant to rhyme. 